and welcome to Talis Art of Taxes for 2021. I'm so glad you all have joined us tonight. Uh, I'm really sad I'm not there in person. We've got representatives from Houston and Austin here, and I'm used to being able to see them in person and see all of you in person, and we really miss that during this time. So I just wanted to welcome you and say that all of TALIS programs are supported by Texas Commission on the Arts, the National Endowment of the Arts, and the Texas Bar Foundation. In addition to those three, we've got two organizations here on the ground in Houston and Austin that have been a huge help to TALA and partnered with us throughout the years. And I'm gonna let them share uh, what they do with you and also give you some tips since we are currently uh, encountering COVID and a big weather situation here in Texas. And I want you to know what they're doing on the ground in your communities. So first I'd like to invite Reyes from Fresh Arts to tell us a little bit about what Fresh Arts is doing. Hi everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you to Alyssa, to Tala for inviting Fresh Arts. We love partnering with Tala every year. Y'all put this on because we know it's chock full of great information. Um, and so my name is Reyes Ramirez. I am the program coordinator for Fresh Arts. If you don't know us, we're a non arts nonprofit organization based primarily out of Houston, Texas. Um, and what we do is we offer resources to artists uh, as though they are small businesses, as though they are uh, their own entities that do their own work, important work. And so we offer uh, workshops, uh, skill-based uh, resources, knowledge sharing, uh, all that good stuff. And what you can do is you can go and look down at that ticker and it's at fresharts.org. I'm gonna do a really quick spiel about uh, what we do and how you can access those things. But I just wanna say uh, first thing, congratulations on being here. Uh, it's really important that you know everything, all the tools that are available at your disposal. And that includes uh, for better or worse taxes, right? And so with more knowledge comes more power. And so we're always happy to partner with Tala with this. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share some of our resources real quick, not take up too much of your time for the main event, but let me just do this. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and then I'm going to show you some of our cool stuff that we can offer that you can access from anywhere. So even though we're based out of Houston primarily, you can be in Austin, you can be anywhere and access this information as if it's pertinent to you. So first thing I want to do is uh, if you go to fresharts.org and you go to our little pull down panel over here, you can go to our artist opportunity board and see what opportunities are available to artists such as yourself. And we even have it uh, by deadline and then by also by uh what field you're in so whether it be in cinema crafting dance all that good stuff and so here's some things to look into so one thing is the Rauschenberg medical emergency grants if you're a choreographer or a visual artist you can tap into this resource to look into and apply to and this covers medical emergency uh, fees and bills uh, so definitely look into that if you're in need of that um, Another thing to keep in mind, if, so if you click here, FEMA is obviously now in Texas because of the large weather event, that being the cold. Uh, I myself was without power for several days. I would not do it again. Uh, it was not great. But uh, the president's action, as it states here, makes federal funding available to all these affected counties. Um, and so just so you know, what you should be doing now is taking pictures of any damages done to your home. Um, and uh, also saving your receipts. So if you bought a dehumidifier, if you bought anything to help you deal with the situation, keep those receipts, take pictures of any damage. Um, and they actually do, the FEMA agents actually do virtual appointments. So you actually be walking them through some of that damage and stuff. So definitely, definitely apply to this and look into this resource if you need it. Another thing we do is we have an artist resource library. Uh, where we into topics break down different topics that we think artists usually run into. And so one thing you can do is you can, let's say, click, for example, on fundraising and grants. So if you're getting into the grant writing game and you want to get those grants for your uh, work um, and your practice, definitely go into here. And here you can actually see, for example, we created a grant proposal writing workshop. Uh, what you can do is you can click here and you can get a virtual workshop that we conducted uh, on grant writing. Uh, if you're more of like a visual uh, person like writing, we also have a toolkit that goes with this that you can tap into and you can download and you can work on on your own time. So that's another thing that we do. 
another thing that we do as well is this is primarily for Houston uh, organizations or artists or collectives. And so we offer our fiscal sponsorship program that allows for individual, ar individual artists or collectives it, to uh, share our nonprofit status to access uh, grants and funds that they normally wouldn't be able to. So definitely look into this. Uh, you can also, you'll also be able to accept uh, donations to your collective or to your project, uh, and they will be tax deductible with our fiscal sponsorship. And so we have our own process. If you're based out of Houston, definitely check into this. Um, this is the dual toolkits that I told you about. So far, we have project budgeting tips and templates, grant proposal writing, uh, goal setting tools, how to write an artist statement and bio, and you can download those for free. And these these are available to anyone, whether you're in Austin, El Paso, what have you. Um, just another quick thing, we have a podcast that goes into artist resources, and they ask the podcast asks different career questions for artists, whether it be should you go full time with your creative practice, should you move to another city for its art scene, and we talk to experienced artists who have made these decisions, and we uh, they offer almost kind of contra uh, points counterpoints to each other. Definitely check this out. Uh, another thing just real quick is our Fresh Arts Summit. Uh, Summit. We offer that every year. It's a very, very nominal fee. Uh, and what we do is for a day or two, we offer a series of day-long workshops that help that uh, seek to help you in your career. So definitely keep checking back and you can sign up for uh, newsletters, which is what I want to get into next, the Artist Resource Newsletter. Uh, so if you don't feel like visiting our website every day or anything like that, every first and third Thursday of the month, we send out a newsletter letting you know of all the deadlines and resources that are available to you, uh, any deadlines that are coming up for the month. So definitely subscribe to this, sign up, and you'll get to know a lot of things. And so that's it for me. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Uh, I hope if you ran into any hardships in the last week that you're recovering, um, and I wish you the best. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Ray. This is the great thing about doing this online is that now people outside of Houston can tap into resources that they may have never heard about otherwise. So that is a silver lining to doing to doing things online. So I want to turn to Emily Miller with the Austin Music Foundation to let us know a little bit about what they've been up to. Thanks, Louisa. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Emily Miller, and I'm the Outreach and Communications Manager at Austin Music Foundation. Uh, we're really excited to be working with Tala and Fresh Arts for our annual Art of Taxes workshop. Uh, we know this year especially there's going to be a lot of questions relating to unemployment and pandemic relief aid, and we're really grateful to Tala, Kathy, and Lisa for sharing their expertise with all of us tonight. Um, for those of you who are new to Austin Music Foundation, we're a nonprofit whose mission is to strengthen, connect, and advance the local music industry and community in Austin. Um, after nearly two decades, AMF remains the only nonprofit in Austin dedicated to providing year-round music business training and professional development, completely free of cost to the artist community. We do this through impact-driven programs, webinars like this, focused mentor opportunities, and networking opportunities. We strive to provide a better pathway to career sustainability for Austin's working musicians and industry professionals. Due to the pandemic, our programs and consultations are now taking place entirely online. While we miss seeing our community in person, we're actually excited about this online opportunity because it allows us to make our resources available to artists and musicians outside of Austin. Um, so if you're based in Houston or, or anywhere else, wherever you may be tuning in from, um, you can visit our website, our Facebook page to find these artist resources, past workshops we've done, things covering topics like sync licensing, copyright, um, basically ways that artists can bring in money. Um, to learn more about our programs and ways you can get involved, you can visit our website, which is scrolling down there on the bottom of the screen. That's austinmusicfoundation.org. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter and follow us on social media. We're pretty much everywhere. You can just search Austin Music Foundation. Um, we wanna thank the Cultural Arts Division of Austin for their continued support. And of course, to the hardworking teams at Tala and Fresh Arts for putting this important workshop together. 
Um, and again, we just want to say thank you all for tuning in tonight. Um, you know, anyone tuning in from Texas, we just really hope you're safe and taking the necessary, necessary time to recover from last week's storms. There are a lot of really great organizations on the ground right now working overtime to help the community recover and provide folks that are still in need with the basic necessities like food and water. Um, so if you're in need or if you know someone that is, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and we would be happy to point you in the right direction. Um, thank you all so much and I'll pass it back to Elisa. Great. Thanks so much. And just as a reminder, this tonight is part one of the series, which was supposed to happen last week. And so the series is extended to next week, part two on Wednesday night. That is March the 3rd. So just make sure that you've signed up for both uh, sessions. They are different. So to get the entire content of the seminar, you would need to go to both nights. Um, if you've attended one before, you know these last two to two and a half hours usually. So we've kind of split that up. And so we're hoping we found a middle ground there so we'll see how that goes since we usually do this at once but we're hoping that each one will be around an hour to hour 15 minutes tonight and next week so please go register if you haven't and you also can tell your friends that this will be online by Friday on uh, the YouTube channel for Tala and if they'd like to go watch it they can or they can watch it before next Wednesday or you do not have to watch it before coming next Wednesday you would still get something of value so I'm going to go on now Lisa if you could bring up the first of the slides for me quickly and then can I go to the first one so just quickly, I wanted to just say a, a, a minute about what Tal has been doing. Um, first, I'll say we did two seminars this week, or I guess two weeks ago on the Paycheck Protection Program, and we have been answering questions on that. That is open again for second draw. If you are trying to apply and you have questions, we would be happy to answer those questions, and you would just need to go to our website, and there's a form that you can request for any COVID-19 questions or any questions associated to COVID-19. It doesn't have to be Paycheck Protection Program. I just say that because we're getting a lot right now. But if you happen to miss our seminar or you could go watch it on our YouTube channel, you still have a question, please let us know and we'll help you and walk you through the process to apply for that. Um, otherwise, Tala gives business assistance to artists on a number of things. The slide that was previous just listed some of the things that we do. So I hope you had a chance to read that. If you need help with any of those things or other things related to your career, there is a membership fee to join us. And that's the second slide. Next slide. Yeah. And it's $75 for an individual. And that would that would basically be last for a whole year. This slide also, I wanted to point out that we are financially based to get one-on-one -on -one assistance from an accountant or attorney. It starts basically if you're solo, or you're a single person, you cannot make over 38,000 to enter that program. So 38,000 would be the maximum there. It goes up if you're a husband and wife or you have a child that goes up to 51,000 and so on. And that grid is also on our website. So you can see if you would qualify for that program. Um, we do help small nonprofits with anything from applying to be a nonprofit to employee issues, contract issues, copyright issues, things like that. That is $250 and you have to have a budget below 200,000. We do have a patent pro bono program if you are an inventor or know someone that may be interested in filing for a patent and that is a $100 fee. If you could go to the next question, the next slide, Lisa. I just covered two slides at once. Again, it's $75. You can ask as many questions as you want as an artist throughout the year. $250 annually for a nonprofit. Again, make as many requests as you want throughout the year and it's $100 for inventors. Um, just a reminder, our upcoming programs next week, part two, of the Art of Taxes. On March 9th, we're actually having our first patent pro bono clinic. We're going to offer consultations one-on-one -on -one with patent attorneys. So if you do have an invention or you're wondering or you're thinking about applying for a patent, uh, please sign up for that. And then we've got an arts legal line we do every quarter. Our next one is on April 6th. Again, that's a calling clinic for any legal issues that you would have as an artist. And then the COVID-19 response program that I talked about, that is ongoing. There is no fee for those pro that program. Those are one-off referrals to answer your questions that come up immediately. Uh, so find more at our website, tallarts.org. Um, I'm going to now I know we've I'm sorry. Did somebody oh, say something? Alisa, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I'm breaking in here. Um, we did have one question. 
Okay. With respect to you, you mentioned that you were going to put this um, up on the Tyler website uh, or out on the YouTube channel. Um, they wanted to know, let a question asked, how long will this recording be available? So I think that, you know, as long as the information is current and it's valuable, I know we don't really have a timeline for that. I would say, you know, at least through the filing season of this year for taxes. So I would say you don't have to hurry and watch it in the next two weeks, um, okay. that it would be at least up until this tax season is over. All right. Thank you. Sure. Um, and I wanted to introduce the two people for tonight, uh, Kathy Plo, who just got off. Oh, she's back. Yay. <laughs> I'm back. And <laughs> Lisa Stratinovic. <laughs> Kathy is an Austin-based CPA and past president of TALA. Uh, she was president when I was hired at TALA. So I have known her throughout my whole duration, and she has been just such a help to artists in the Houston area and all over. Uh, we've got Lisa in Austin. She also has been with me pretty much since the beginning. I think she is the first person I recruited when I got my job here back in whatever, 2012. So we've been together also a long time. She takes individual consultations. She's also a past board member. And so she knows a lot about what we do. And I know you're going to find the information valuable from these two ladies. And I'm going to let Lisa take it over finally you're saying so I guess take it away Lisa. <laughs> Thanks Elisa. Well hello my name is Lisa and I am the Velocity Detective. As Elisa mentioned I am a CPA here in the Austin area uh, but I, I work all over the world to be completely honest. Uh, we, this is a two-part series and tonight we are starting out predominantly looking at how you guys as artists are, are actually a business. And we wanna make sure that you've got yourself set up with the right mindset and have the tools and uh, tips and tricks that you need to actually keep yourself running efficiently as a business. The second part uh, dives a little bit deeper into the tax side of things. So you'll definitely want to make sure that you sign up for that. It is a separate uh, uh, sign up process. You actually have to sign up for both of them. So if you signed up for part one and you didn't sign up for part two, make sure you do that the very first thing uh, after we get off of this uh, tonight. So we're going to go over uh, what it means to be self-employed. Is there a difference between that and being an independent contractor? We're going to talk a little bit about the different business structure types like an LLC. We're also going to talk about the best practices for making sure that your books are in order and uh, you know what it means to get a form 1099 miscellaneous versus a 1099 NEC. Those are two different things this year and that's a little bit confusing. Also, what happens when you know you yes, you understand that you are a business person when you when you exchange uh, compensation for your goods or services as an artist. But my golly, you also have a W two job. You know, maybe you maybe you work at a restaurant, or maybe you uh, have an office job in addition to uh, the gig economy. How do you kind of think about that, right? Also, what is it, you know, you, you've played guitar for most of your life and sometimes you, you played it at your, your brother's birthday party and that's a hobby. What, how is that different from uh, being in business? And then finally, we're going to dip our toes a little bit into, well, last year and even right now, I'm still getting some unemployment because, um, I, I haven't been able to perform and I haven't been able to do my art necessarily. I've got some uh, PPP loan. I got a, um, an idle grant. What does all of that mean? So we're going to jump right into the deep end and talk about who is self-employed and the IRS does not actually make a distinction between the words self-proprietor, i.e. self-employed, and independent contractor. Basically, if you are able to call the shots, if you have a, a goods or services that you, as I mentioned, exchange 
for compensation. Now, that usually compensation means money, but not always, right? What if you uh, exchange a piece of your art for somebody to help you with your bookkeeping, right? That would be a barter, and that's still considered compensation. So the official definition is that you exchange goods or services for compensation, this is the key, with the intent to make a profit, right? Everybody write that down, with the intent to make a profit. Now, what's the definition of profit? Profit is you take all of your income and then subtract all of your expenses. What's left over is what you get to put in your back pocket, right? That's your profit. And that's if you intend to make a profit, then you are by definition in business. And guess what? You are by default, if you're the only one doing it, you are a sole proprietor. And therefore, from a tax perspective, you'll end up needing to file a tax return on your individual tax return, an extra schedule called Schedule C. Just want to make sure that you guys understand, put uh, questions in the chat like we had earlier. We are more than happy to, uh, to answer them as we go. So uh, this could be an, a more interactive uh, conversation rather than just listening to the beautiful Velocity Detective uh, the whole time, right? So don't hold your questions. Make sure you put them in the chat. There are a number of different business structures. I mentioned that if you are the only one doing the art and uh, it's in exchange for compensation and with the intent to make a profit, by default, you're going to be a sole proprietorship. That the word sole proprietor, independent contractor, gig worker, um, side hustle, all of those fall into this uh, bucket called sole proprietorship. Oh my goodness, there's also things like partnerships, limited liability partnerships, limited liability companies, and then corporations like an S corporation or a C corporation. We're gonna kind of go over those just a little bit so you guys have a flavor for what those are, especially that limited liability company. The sole proprietor, that's the easiest one if you exchange your goods or services for compensation with the intent to make a profit, immediately you're in business, right? So it's super easy to start. You don't have to tell the state, you don't have to tell the federal government, you just do it. Uh, the downside is that you personally have an, an unlimited liability exposure, meaning if someone wants to bring legal action against you or your company, then, uh, then all of your personal assets are at risk. In addition to that, you need to make sure that you pay quarterly estimated taxes, uh, and those are gonna be due on 415, 615, 915, and then again on January 15th, right? I've already mentioned that you, from a tax perspective, will file Form 1040, you'll add, that's your personal federal tax return, and you'll add just an additional Schedule C. Uh, you'll also uh, pay self-employment taxes on Schedule SE. So if you had just a, a one W-2 from maybe that restaurant job that I mentioned earlier, uh, then you would put that on your 1040, and then everything else would be on Schedule C, which flows to the front page of that 1040. Um, that is all going to be due normally on April 15th, and then if you extend it on October 15th. But guess what? Uh, because of the entire snowstorm that we had come through the complete state of Texas last uh, last week. Who was affected? Raise your hand, right? Almost everybody, right? At least you were cold, right? Um, they've moved the date uh, from 415 
until Kathy, can you back me up here? It's June 15th. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. June 15th. And you all don't right. have to, it's automatically till June 15th. You don't have to do anything. Uh, you know, you don't have to do an, an extension or anything. It's just automatically till June 15th. Then if that still doesn't give you enough time, then you extend it to October 15th. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kathy. That's, uh, and, and as she mentions, it's just automatic, right? No. If you have all of your bookkeeping all up to date, you can certainly uh, send it in now. That's not a problem. They just understand that uh, I had a pipe bust in my house and my music studio flooded. Well, if I had some uh, my paperwork there to do my tax return, it would take me maybe a little bit longer to try and deal with uh, recovering from that as well as get the taxes in on time. So fortunately they gave us a little bit of extra time. Uh, but if you've got your stuff, you can certainly get it in now. A lot of people think, okay, I, I want to be a real company. And so I'm going to form a limited liability company and the, they are fantastic vehicles for ensuring that you don't have any personal liability, it's separated, but you've got some obligations when it comes to making sure that if you have a limited liability company in place, that you treat it definitely like a separate company. Even if you don't, as soon as you put that business hat on, Soon as you exchange goods or services for compensation with the intent to make a profit, you're in business. So you put your business hat on. The very, very first thing that you should do is have a separate business bank account. All right. Now, with a limited liability company, it's pretty easy to get signed up for that business bank account. If you do not have one, most banks in Texas now are requiring that you have a DBA, that's doing business as, and you would need to file that with the county that you're in. The limited liability company, it uh, helps protect you personally from any liability that uh, would be brought against the company, but, uh, and, and, but it's just a state entity. It has the members that are that own it. And when you have just one person who owns it, then you would still file your Schedule C with your 1040 tax return. So you still are a sole proprietor from a tax perspective, even though you have this limited liability company. So you have an LLC, you're still taxed as a sole proprietor. Boy, that's a lot of words, right? Let's go over that again. Limited liability company with one owner by default is a sole proprietor on your tax return. That means you'll just simply file a Schedule C with your 1040 tax return. Now you can make an S or a C corporation election, but you would really wanna to talk to your CPA about that if you're thinking about something like that, you don't have a CPA, make sure that you check in a TALA because that's one of those things that you could ask uh, the, the CPAs that volunteer at TALA, right? That'd be a great question. Now, if you've got more than one owner, let's say that you're in a band and the band has, you know, the drummer and the singer and the guitar player. Well, all of a sudden you have more than one person which means that you would either default to a partnership tax return or an S or a C corporation. Again, it'd be best to consult with a CPA, your, your wise counsel on that, just to make sure that you uh, are utilizing the taxes that would be to your best advantage. I mentioned partnerships, that's actually a separate tax return so when you're a sole proprietor, 
you have one tax return that's form 1040 with an, addi an additional schedule, Schedule C. Uh, but if you have more than one owner, uh, then you would have a, an actually a separate tax return. The partnership tax return, it also, you would have uh, definitely want that partnership agreement. And uh, you also have to pay Texas franchise tax. Uh, now, those returns are due 315, March 15th and uh, September 15th. Even if you don't have a partnership, if you have a limited liability company, as a sole proprietor, that means there's only one owner, and you're going to file a personal 1040 tax return with Schedule C, you still have to uh, fill out the Texas franchise tax returns. Now, uh, you don't actually have to pay any tax until you make over $1.3 million. Kathy, am I around that? Okay, I was. I knew this was coming. <laughs> it's one million one hundred and eighty thousand dollars is the cap for this year, and so you know if you happen to have uh, you know two million dollars for some reason, you know, yay, that would be awesome. Then you would have to pay it, and just to let you know that the tax rate is point three, three, one percent. So it's, it's pretty low, but you know, the, the point of the story is you don't have to pay anything, but you got to file this every year, every year. And there's a $50 fine if you don't file it. Okay. So it's, if you have a limited liability company, a partnership, a, an S corporation, a limited partnership, any of those, you still have to make sure that you file that with the state of Texas. So there's some other entity types, um, limited liability partnerships, and uh, those are subject not only to the Texas franchise tax, but also to unemployment tax. So you would have to make sure that you paid those quarterly estimated payments. And uh, also with, um, so on a corporation, that those are a little bit different. You wouldn't pay your quarterly taxes if it was an S corporation, but on a C corporation, the company itself would have to pay those quarterly taxes. And most of us here are going to fall into probably the sole proprietor or the partnership. So kind of we're going to focus a little bit more on those with regards to how we keep our records. But keeping the, the records and running a business is a, a, about the same. It doesn't really matter what entity type you are. Uh, S corporation, the difference between it and the C corporation is that the S corporation is a flow through, even though the um, officers and employees can receive W-2s. So the absolute number one thing that I want you guys to take away from tonight is that if you are in business, and let's go over that again. You're in business. If you exchange goods or services for compensation with the intent to make a profit, okay? If you are in business, then you want to look and act like you are in business. And the absolute number one thing that will help you do that is to have a separate bank account. Uh, it used to be okay to simply have a separate checking account that was uh, a personal account. But as we found out, Kathy, uh, with this PPP loan stuff that's going on, they actually want you to have a separate business bank account. 
right? They want you, if you are, if you truly are a business and you need this loan because you are a business, have a separate business account. That's, that's correct. I think we found out last year when the first PPP loan round came out, when everybody was rushing to get the money, the banks were really only utilizing, you know, allowing their customers that had a business bank account to get there first. And so we saw that. And so uh, Lisa, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, I know uh, the people that come to my class in Houston all the time, you know, I always told them get a, a separate bank account, you know, but now we need to say a separate business bank account. And, you know, I mean, if they charge you a, a, you know, a bank charge, it's expense, you can expense it off. It's a business expense. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> it is a business expense. Um, a lot of the credit unions have uh, business bank accounts that if you only have a few transactions per month, they're free. Um, there are some online bank accounts that are business bank accounts that uh, that you can utilize that way and they're very inexpensive to free. So there, there are options out there that you can still, um, you know, that don't cost very much as Kathy mentioned, it, even if it does cost you a little bit per month, it's part of doing business. And guess what? You guys are still in business. So another way to make it look like you are in business is to get that EIN, that employer identification number. It's a pretty easy process. Go to irs.gov. There's a, a little application that you have to file, uh, fill in, and it's all online. I will warn you that right now the IRS is really super backed up. So it might take you a little bit of uh, time to get it, but uh, four to six weeks right now is looking like what it is, right? And make sure that you, you have substantiating evidence uh, for your income, for your deductions and for your credits, right? That means keep those receipts, keep, uh, make, make, an official invoice, even if it's uh, just in word, right? And another really cool thing about the IRS now is they will take PDFs. You don't have to keep things uh, in, in paper anymore, right? You can take a picture with your phone of the piece of paper and save it to a OneDrive, save it to Google Docs, and that counts for when the IRS is looking at whether or not you've got substantiating evidence for your information. Not only do you want to keep your business bank account, uh, have it there, but you actually want to separate your personal finances from your business finances. And that is the biggest reason that you want a separate bank account. What do we? What do we mean by that, right? Separate my business and personal. If I'm a guitar player and somebody pays me cash to perform for them, well, that's my money. And that is true, but it's your business's money because you exchange services in this case for compensation with the intent to make a profit. Therefore, it's business. You need to put that cash into your business bank account and then immediately move it to your personal bank account and then pay your rent, then pay your car payment, then take Lisa out for a margarita. Uh-huh. So um, you see, you got to put it first into your business bank account and then move it to your personal bank account and putting it into like your left hand pocket and moving it to your right hand pocket doesn't count. You want that, that digital paper trail that proves that you put it into your business first. The second big tip is actually having a spending plan for your business. What, what does that mean, right? Well, if you kind of think about uh, a spending plan as a budget that looks to the future, 
Okay, so if you just have a budget that says, okay, I'm going to spend a little bit on my phone and a little bit on my art supplies and, uh, and a little bit um, on uh, my website, right? Well, if I know those costs in advance of next month, I know how many gigs I need to have in order to pay for those expenses. So you're thinking about a budget just says, I need those expenses paid. The spending plan makes you think in the future about when I need things and how much money I need to make to make sure that those are paid. Like, think about this. Um, I pay for an entire year of Zoom um, in advance because I get a little bit of a discount. But that means that I need to be thinking about the fact that I'm going to have to pay it in October of 2021 way before that bill gets here. Otherwise, I'm going to be surprised and we definitely don't want that to happen. The other thing you need to think about is paying yourself first. Okay, how much do you need to take out of the company to pay your own personal bills, right? So you kind of need to have a spending plan on your personal side in addition to your business side, okay? So having a spending plan, though, tells uh, the IRS, tells the banks that, that you're thinking about your business as a real viable thing, right? And if you've got the spending plan that looks all the way out to at least October, then you're also going to be thinking about keeping your records, keeping your accounting, your bookkeeping on a monthly basis. You can't wait until the end of the year and do it just for taxes. It is, it is vital that you do it at least periodically, ideally monthly. Kathy, what do you think? What's your best advice? Monthly, quarterly, definitely not annual. All right, I'm sorry about that. I wasn't paying attention to you because I was <laughs> I was answering the chat questions. Uh, I was. What do you think? What is your best advice? How often should you do your bookkeeping? Uh, at least every month. I mean, uh, at least every month. I mean, you know, once a week probably is good, um, but every month for sure. <laughs> And right. don't let it, because it gets, it just gets too much as you start, you know, going down the line and you forget what you may have spent something for. And it's a lot easier to do it just a little piece at a time than to turn around and have a big pile of receipts that you need to enter in or, you know, if you're not scanning them or whatever. So do a little bit every time. It's, it's not only that, but as we found out about PPP, you need to have monthly or at least quarterly uh, be able to track it, right? So just saying that I made $10,000 last year isn't good enough anymore. Just for the PPP2 loan application, one of the things that they wanted to know was how much did you make every quarter, right? So if you don't have your information at a granular enough level to be able to answer these questions and you're scrambling, well, you might miss the window of opportunity to apply for things like this. So Lisa, um, Lisa has a question. Yes. Is can you use your business bank account to help domestic deficiencies? <laughs> the answer is no. But, all right, if you are a sole proprietor, then, and you have extra cash in your business bank account, then you take a draw and you move it from your business bank account to your personal bank account, and then you pay any personal deficiencies out of your personal bank account, all right? So if you need extra money in, uh, to pay for things uh, you have 
a, a birthday party coming up and you need a new outfit and you need a present for the birthday girl. March 6th, by the way. Um, I like diamonds and chocolate. Uh, so you might need to take some extra money out of the business. That's okay. It is your business and you need to pay yourself out of it. All right. So you did, but you have to put the money first in the business bank account and then simply move it to the personal bank account. When you do that as a sole proprietor, that is a non taxable event. You don't pay any extra taxes for moving it over, but you do need to keep track of all of that. And you need to have it go from the business bank bank account, right? Again, not just this pocket, into that pocket. Uh, you need to make sure that when you are thinking about your invoices, you actually have dates on them. Uh, now you can use, you know, things like an application or, or your phone, right? Uh, for doing a lot of it. You can take, as I mentioned, receipts. You can take pictures of them. Uh, there's apps uh, for keeping track of things like your business mileage. But uh, you need to make sure that you keep track of those in a fairly detailed level so that you went, so basically you can fill out that Schedule C. And let's go, so the five top best practices to make sure that you look like you're in business are to keep those finances separate, to make sure that you have a spending plan so that you're looking toward the future so that you can think about paying yourself first out of the profits and you do that record keeping at least monthly. Uh, and then make sure you go back and update that spending plan for any adjustments, right? Maybe uh, maybe you got a better deal on Zoom because you took advantage of some coupon that they were advertising. And instead of $120 in October, it's only gonna be $50. Well, hot diggity dog, now, uh, you know that margarita that you were planning on in March? Well, now you can have one in February and in March. Oh, I like this. You can use something as simple as uh, spreadsheets to make all of this happen. Depends on how complex your, uh, your business is, but especially because things are getting a lot more in depth now the, for the PPP, to loan where they needed you to have your revenue by quarter, your expenses by quarter, right? It's much, much better if you use something like a, a, a real system that's designed for business, right? Again, if you are using QuickBooks or Xero or Wave, W-A-V-E is a free one, right? Then you will look more like a business. The more you look like a business, the more you act like a business, the more that the IRS believes you're in business. Kathy, what do you got? Um, I was just going to say that um, when, when we were talking, um, there is, you know, there is a uh, something that's called a dome book. I don't know, Lisa, if you have know even what I'm talking about. Um, it's called a dome book because it's actually got a capital dome on the front cover. And, uh, you, you know, you could probably get it, you know, Office Depot or whatever. But what was nice about the dome book, if you don't want to get, I mean, if you're going to get down to the manual system of writing something down, you know, I'd rather do it in something like the dome book because what it has, it's, it's, it's got pre-printed pages for every month. And then on the left side, it's like all of the, uh, you know, lines to put all your income. And then on the other side, it's got listing of all the different expenses and it's already got them pre, you know, listed out. And so it's a basically kind of fill in the blank. The back part of it has, you know, where you can keep track of your mileage 
And I want to say it even had maybe pockets or something, you know, where you could put some stuff in or whatever. But uh, I mean, even even if, you know, we'd rather utilize the computer as much as possible, make it easy. I'm like, use technology. I know a lot of the people um, that I deal with here in Houston, a lot of people really like to use that QuickBooks for self-employed. And, you know, it's it's not a true bookkeeping system as, as us, you know, the debit and credit, you know, side of it. But, um, you know, it does work and, you know, it's at least it's electronic. And so, you know, I would use as much as you can electronics as free as you can. But if you're going to go down to the old scale of, of writing or whatever, use something like that that's already pre-printed so you don't have to, you know, think about it and and work on it that way so yeah yeah again uh wave w-a-v-e apps.com is a, a free version of uh, an electronic system it's in the cloud and uh you can save your receipts to it uh quickbooks uh online and zero have have things that are as inexpensive as 10 or $12 a month. And uh, so make sure that you're using a system though. Again, remember that as an artist, if you are exchanging goods or services for compensation, if the intention to make a profit, you're in business. If you're in business, you should be using a system. Let's talk about 1099 NECs, all right? So this year, the IRS decided that it was going to bring back this 1099 form for uh, non-employee compensation. So in the past, you probably got 1099 miscellaneouses for uh, if you did gig work somewhere or uh, you, you worked as a sole proprietor or an independent contractor in uh, for the year ending 2020. In other words, the ones that you're going to get this year in 2021 and going forward, you you should be getting a 1099 NEC instead. So now, what about uh, wh why would you get one? That's again, if you were a gig worker, um, a sole proprietor, independent contractor. Uh, and you did uh, actual work, not uh, that you sold some goods to somebody, but you uh, performed a service for them in the course of your trader business or in the course of their trader business, um, then they would give you a 1099. If, you, if they paid you more than $600 in cash, check, or debit card no not a debit card cash check or ach uh-huh cash check or ach if they paid you through something like paypal or venmo or uh gusto right then there is a potential that they wouldn't be giving you a 1099 nec well, let me take that back on gusto that's not one it actually has to be a payment processing uh, service, all right? So again, let's think about uh, PayPal, right? Uh, another one that's uh, a lot of people are, are on right now are, oh, uh, where you sign up and it's like 10 or $15 an hour and you can do web design and, um, virtual assisting, oh my goodness, I can't remember the name of it. I'll think of it by the time I get off of here. And uh, so you would not be getting a 1099 from the other person. Just because you don't get a 1099 doesn't mean that you don't have to report that income. You still do, okay? It's just that they might not be obligated to give you a 1099 if they paid you through a payment processing company or they paid you less than $600 for the entire year. And 
Uh, you should have already received uh, a Form 1099 uh, NEC. If you mistakenly received a 1099 miscellaneous, you might want to contact that company that gave it to you uh, because they might have given you the wrong form. Uh, but we make sure that you still count it as revenue regardless of which form they gave you. There's also a $50 per subcontractor fine if uh, you are supposed to give somebody else a 1099 NEC. Uh, let's go back to that web design. If you didn't hire them through this company's name, who I can't remember at the moment, um, and you hired them just off the, uh, the street, they're a friend of yours, and you paid them more than $600 in cash, check, or ACH, then you should be giving them a 1099, potentially. And if you don't, then there's up to a $50 fine. Uh, and if you don't have their correct uh, information, then you could even be fined for that. One thing to think about is when you are filling out your form W-9, so you're, you may be doing some gig work for somebody and they have you fill out this form W-9. In box one, that's the name that's on the front page of your 1040 tax return if you are a sole proprietor. It's also the name that's on your social security card. Okay, that's what goes in box one. Now, uh, if you uh, have a DBA, that would go in box two. And if you have, are a single member LLC, then you would put that name, the limited liability company's name in box two, and you would check that first box in in under uh, section three. That says that you are an individual or sole proprietor and you, there's only one member to the limited liability company. If those are all in line, right? Whether or not you're just a sole proprietor or you have a limited liability company and you're still filing a schedule C, you would put your social security number in part one. Uh, there has been a little bit of confusion around that over the last couple of years where somebody got some information from somebody that, hey, if they have a li limited liability company and I have an EIN, I can use that on my Form W-9 instead of my Social Security number so that that protects me. That is incorrect information. Right now, the IRS says, I want to know absolutely positive what who's on that uh, tax return they're all that's all they're concerned about is your tax return and if you are a sole proprietor then you're going to be filing a 1040 tax return with the schedule C then that is your legal name that's on your social security card and your social security number so uh, what do you do when you have some uh, 1099 NEC, but uh, you're not, you don't actually have like a business separate from anything. You did one gig work for somebody, but you don't have any expenses or anything. That would still go on box eight, again, from that schedule C. And your W-2 would go in box one. Kathy, what do you got? Okay. Uh, this was from LaBelle. Is the company Fiverr? Fiverr. That's one of them. Thank you so, so much. Can't believe it. The other one, ah, uh, I want to say it starts with an I. It's very, very similar to Fiverr. Yes. And all of that income would be going on your Schedule C your fiber income, along with your gig income, along with uh, your art income, okay? That would all go on your Schedule C. We talked a little bit about uh, being in business means that your intention is to make a profit. And 
really one of the reasons why you want to look and act like a business when your intention is to make a profit is so that you can make sure that you don't fall under any of these things called hobby loss rules, okay? Um, in the past, we used to be able to take uh, the expenses that were associated with having a hobby against any income that we might have received. I've got a friend in uh, San Antonio that's a woodworker, and for five or six years, he would, on his weekends and, and just because he enjoyed doing it, make some handmade furniture. Well, John, at the time, he would get two or $300 for a really nice bench. He would get three or $400 for a really nice chair. And as it turns out, he was uh, spending about two or $300 in material to make this and about $400 to make that. So all things considered, he was netting to zero. He was doing it because he enjoyed doing it. Well, now he would have to report that $200 and that $400 as income and even as a hobby. And he doesn't get to take those expenses, right? So it's better if you look and act like a company with the intent to make a profit so that you can take those expenses against that income. Now, if you look like a hobby and you try to take those expenses, you're not going to be able to net those out. Kathy, go. Oh, okay. I, I was just going to, I'm not, I just want to make sure that you're going to talk about this because this is the section. We had a question earlier um, uh, in the evening about how, um, um, how would, how does one prove or disprove intent? You know, you were saying that you have to show that you are intending to make a profit. And I remember when I was going to accounting school at U of H and, and, you know, they were always saying, you know, you were in business to make a profit. You wouldn't be in business without wanting to make a profit. So how do you really kind of, how, how would one show intent that they really are trying to make a profit? One of the best ways to do that is to have that spending plan, right? So, First of all, if you have a business plan before you even start your business, uh, that's that's the very beginning. But let's say that you've been in, in doing your art for several years now, right? Your business plan was back then. Now you have your business bank account. You separate your business income from your personal income and expenses. Uh, you do your uh, record keeping on a monthly basis. You're really good about that. You're filing your Schedule C every year. And um, this year, though, uh, especially in 2020, there was no way that we could make a profit, even if we intended to, right? So first of all, the spending plan says, I have these expenses. I have uh that my art supplies, I've got my website, I've got my Zoom, okay, uh, and my phone. Got to have the phone in there. So I've got these expenses, and my intention is to uh, make sure I have enough gigs so that my profit or my my income is more than my expenses. So you and, and income minus expenses is profit. And so if you can show the IRS that your intention based on your spending plan was to make a profit, even if you didn't, at least you can show that, hey, I had this document, I've, I've kept up with it every month. And even though I can't make a profit right now because of the pandemic, because of the snow apocalypse, right? Uh, there's no way I could have made a profit, but my intention originally was to do so. 
Uh, my understanding is that now they uh, the the IRS expects you to make a profit. Isn't it three out of every five years now, Kathy? Yes, that is that's still that way. Okay, so that's the expectation, right? Uh, the IRS also expects that if you are a startup, that you're probably not going to make a profit that first year. Because guess what? You have to do advertising, you've got to do marketing, you don't have your products all lined up, right? So the expectation is that first couple of years are probably not going to make a profit. But if that first couple of years turns into 10 years, they're going to really wonder, are you serious about really wanting to make a profit? Because if you were, it seems like you would have put forth more effort. Well, it's either, either maybe you shouldn't be doing this. I mean, if, if I've been doing this for 10 years and I'm still not making a profit, then either I need to get some help or, you know, there, there's something else wrong. Um, you know, it's not critical if you, you know, if after you look at three, you know, after the five years, maybe you didn't make a profit in those five years. Well, the IRS isn't going to come down on you per se, but, you know, because they're going to look at everything else. In other and words, if, if you are, you know, if you're a single person and this is your only income, and you're sh continually showing a loss on your tax return. Yeah, they may be questioning, well, how are you living? You know, where are you getting the money? I mean, you know, yeah, you might have, you know, you may, there's, there could be reasonable cause for that. Number one, maybe you had gotten an inheritance or something, which is not taxable generally to you. And that's how you've got the cash to spend. Maybe you're using your credit cards. Maybe, um, you know, there, there are other ways uh, of getting uh, funds, taking a loan, for example. But, um, you know, there are many different ways of doing that. And, and I think, you know, not to go into all of, you know, we were talking about the facts and circumstances, but, you know, looking at that publication and, and I've, you know, we've put there the, that publication number and page number um, on there. Um, if that page number may be different for 2020 because that's a publication that's usually done every year, but that that kind of gives you a whole list. There's like nine or 10 different factors of what the IRS would be looking at if they came and audited you to see. And if you can answer, you know, if you look at those questions and you can answer, you know, well, that kind of gives you an idea of, of what they're looking for so that you can make, you know, do something to mitigate that there wouldn't be a problem with that. Absolutely. And again, if you, so in, in 2020, the chances are just about everybody's going to have a loss. There's going to be a couple of, of uh, people out there that, you know, went the other direction of uh, Zoom, for one, right? But uh, across the board, there's just so many of us that that couldn't work, especially in in the arts industries, right? Uh, so the expectation is that there will be uh, probably a loss in 2020, and that's going to fall into that facts and circumstance test, right? They're going to work across the board, and hey, if next year you're still struggling. And maybe even into the next year because the economy is trying to pick up again, right? So yeah. it's, not, it's not hard and fast. But the more that you look and act like a business, then you the more uh, that you are going to have on your side if you ever do get audited. There, there, was, a, there was a comment. I had to kind of chuckle on this one. It says for some companies, the intent may not be to make a profit, but to use the loss as a tax write-off. Well, yeah, and that's why the IRS sometimes are looking at this, um, you know, to to do that. Um, you know, they kind of squelch some of the writing of the losses when people had rental properties, and so they they came up with some new rules to to you know kind of squash that a little bit. But you know, not. 
you know, I don't think everybody needs to worry about getting audited or whatever. Um, I think if you do everything that, like Lisa has been saying, you know, trying to make a profit personally, I don't think that it's probably not going to get better until 2020. And, and, you know, the IRS is so backed up behind inundated. They don't, you know, if we're looking at somebody that has a three thousand dollar you know i'm just throwing a number out there lost or whatever they're not going to come down on you for that you know um it's just you know the likelihood is just not going to happen but if you do everything that we tell you in this like you're trying to be showing that you're really doing stuff um you know if it's not working out trying to go get some help we got you know we had emily and and uh, reyes on two great uh places that can, you know, tell of courses, resources to, to help, you know, get connected with others to try and make a profit. I mean, because, you know, that's what we want to do. We need to be able to live. So, And we all want you to be successful business owners, especially in the art industries. How exciting is it when, when you can sustain yourself or, or even as a side gig and, and contribute that income to your own personal well-being, that of you and your family. How awesome is that? And we want you to be successful business owners. We're going to overlap now uh, tonight uh, with a little bit of what's coming up next week uh, with unemployment, PPP, and some other relief aid things. Now, remember that uh, if you took unemployment in 2020, or yes, in 2020, that you will be getting a 1099G. Now, 1099G is a completely different uh, form than a 1099NEC. And even though in our heads we're thinking, okay, this unemployment goes for my business, it really is to cover you personally and not, not associated with your business. Therefore, it goes on uh, page one of your 1040 tax return and is not income to your business. Okay, I'm going to repeat that. Your unemployment benefits are not income to your business. However, you owe tax on that money. Uh, your PPP loan uh, is also not, it's a loan, okay, and uh, therefore uh, not income to your business until it's forgiven and then it's other income and the IRS has deemed it as not taxable. And so there's, even if you get it forgiven in 2020, there's nowhere to put it on your Schedule C. Nowhere. Neither the loan portion of it or the forgiveness portion of it. And same with the EIDL, the EIDL grant. There's nowhere to put that. It's not uh, taxable income to your business. There's nowhere to put it on your 1040 tax return. There's nowhere to put it on your Schedule C. It doesn't uh, have anything to do at all with your tax return. If you received other relief aid, uh, most likely it falls under the same category as the PPP and the EIDL loans uh, and is not going to be um, taxable and it's not income. Um, Lisa, I just wanted to, to do a quick reminder for people. Um, I know when a lot of people had applied uh, for unemployment last year with the Texas Workforce Commission, uh, there was a, they had a choice of whether they wanted to take out withholdings or not. Um, and just as a reminder, if you did take out uh, income tax withholdings uh, on the unemployment check, you should have that should also be showing uh, on your uh, 1099G. So don't forget to pick that up um, and include that on your payments 
um, that you have put in because um, that may help you uh, either reduce your tax, uh, certainly would reduce your tax on that um, and give you a, or, or give you a higher refund. So just don't forget to pick that up if you did. So that's just a reminder. And Kathy, that, that would be in box four of this. Oh, yeah, it says federal income tax withholding, right? Yes, yes. So uh, absolutely good point, Kathy. Uh, just to recap, remember that your Paycheck Protection Program, from a tax perspective, there's nothing to do on the tax return when you got the loan. There's nothing to do on the tax return when the loan is forgiven and any of the um, expenses that were paid using those funds uh, still get to flow to Schedule C. You still get to take them as a reduction in your income or in this probable case, it'll end up showing up as a loss. When you're talking about doing your accounting, when you get the loan, it's a liability until it's forgiven and then it's other income uh, and you just record your expenses for your phone and your website and your Zoom just like you normally would. Some other types of relief that um, EIDL grant is on your accounting records. Again, it's just other income and uh, on your tax return, there is nothing to do with it. If you actually took out an idle loan, not the grant, but an actual loan, you would record it as a liability. That means I owe somebody something for this. And uh, any interest that you actually paid, you would get to take on your tax return as an additional deduction. If you got other um, COVID relief grants, now this is not the normal grant if you work for the city and they give you a grant in exchange for your arts or your services. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about COVID specific relief grants, right? Or now that the, <laughs> that the snow has uh, presented yet other issues, maybe we're going to have some uh, federal or state uh, in, uh, additional funds with regards to the disaster there. And um, so right now, technically on the tax return, we don't have any super official guidance, but most likely there's going to be no impact there. So again, my name is Lisa. Kathy has been so gracious to help me out. Do we have any additional questions that we can answer? Um, there hasn't been any that has come up in the last few minutes. I mean, Lisa, you've done an awesome job. So, I mean. <laughs> well, Kathy, you've been such a great help, you know, helping me uh, navigate those questions. Elisa, take us out. So, yeah, thank you so much. This has been great. And I just wanted to remind everyone to join us next week, Wednesday, at the same time, while Kathy's going to take the driver's seat so you can see her lead the discussion. And Lisa will be fielding your questions and adding her input. So join us next week and just register online. We'll be here at the same place. Um, thanks so much to our local partners, Fresh Arts and Austin Music Foundation. And I want to mention the city of Austin. They've been very supportive to us. Um, next week, we're going to cover specifically some 1090 lines, deductions, income. We're going to look at uh, the self-employment tax. And we're also going to touch on some other taxes, the business, personal property and sales. So it will be different content. So please join us to uh, learn what's coming up next. And I wish everyone a very safe and hopefully either productive or relaxing week, whichever one you need after the one we just had. And so uh, thank you again so much and we'll see you next week.